I want to make sure we're clear on this point, however. It is not a shaming session. It is not, Mr. Smith, come up here. You did not get an A on that test. Bad you. Sit down. It's not that. It's gentlemen. We had a 96% attendance rate last week. It is Thursday, and we're at 94%. We have one more day to get us up to meet what we did last week. Let's do it. Bringing everyone together to celebrate the great stuff, to talk about the stuff that we need to do better at, pushes performance and achievement to even higher levels. At the end of community, everyone together recites the urban prep school creed. And I would be remiss if I didn't take a little bit of time just to tell you a bit about the creed. The creed is a statement that is 18 brief sentences long. It's inspired by our motto, we believe. And it was created before we even had an urban prep. It was created the summer before our first class started. All of the teachers got into a room, we had a retreat, and we asked ourselves this question. Our motto is we believe. What is it we want our students to believe? And so we came up with this creed and this statement of purpose, if you will. And it's really proven to be a phenomenal, phenomenal tool for articulating our core values and reinforcing our positive school culture. Um, you know, the third line of our school creed is we are college bound. Imagine saying that for four years every morning and then not being college bound. Words have power. And our students saying these words, I believe, changes their behavior and their aspirations and, frankly, their views of themselves. So I have one more um, piece of our school culture to talk to you about. Um, so I told you there were four. And the last one is the most important, and that's relationships. So if we're going to create these shields that I believe are so important, you know, we want to make sure we have respect, we want to have responsibility, we want to have ritual, we also need to make sure we have relationships. I think it is the single most important thing. I mean, you know, I, I don't think that, you know, even the example that I just, you know, used about, you know, Rich Frankowski, I mean, there was a relationship there that I developed that really drove, I think, me to be a better you know, counselor and hopefully Rich to be a better student in that program. Same thing applies in our schools. And if you look back on your careers as educators and your experiences as students, I'm sure you say that there's one teacher, there's one relationship which really, really, really was impactful. So if you want a breakthrough, if you want to really, really connect with students and change their trajectory, then you got to develop strong, positive, trusting relationships. Every student at Urban Prep is placed in a small group that we call a pride. We're the Urban Prep Lions. Lions live in pride, so we're, um, we call these small groups prides. A student remains in that pride for all four years while they are at Urban Prep. This is a family within a family. It is led by an adult, the pride leader, and that pride leader has the primary responsibility for connecting with the students, mentoring the students, and um, advocating, frankly, on behalf of the students. It's the pride leader who's able to come to the office and say, you know, something's up with Mr. Johnson. Well, what do you mean? Yeah, I'm not quite sure yet. I'm going to find out. Well, what makes you think something's wrong with him? Just the way he looked when I shook his hand. This is the kind of relationship that we want to have created at our school. We want the adults to be able to greet a student in the morning, shake his hand, and know immediately whether it's a good day or a not so good day for the young man. We put a lot of responsibility on our teachers and our pride leaders for this type of work. 
all of our students, all of our um, faculty rather, and administrators, myself included, we have school issued cell phones that all the students and the parents all have the numbers for, um, as well as email accounts. We, unlike many people, encourage social media interaction. We have very clear rules on appropriateness of that interaction, but we want to foster and develop these relationships and these bonds. It is not unusual for me or a teacher or anyone to get a phone call on a Wednesday night, what's the homework, or do we have a test tomorrow, or tell this boy to take out the garbage, <laughs> or it's one o'clock in the morning, do you know where my child is? These relationships are key to the urban prep school culture and to the success that we are able to have. I've spent all this time up to this point talking about Rich Frankowski and telling you um, a, a, a lot about kind of what we do and not really telling you about our kids. And I think that it's important that before I get off this stage that I at least share a couple of stories with you about our students themselves. Um, I think that you know these stories really kind of crystallize what we're all about and what all schools, frankly, can be about. Uh, Mr. Branch did not want to come to Urban Prep. He was not interested in being in an all-boys school. He wasn't interested in wearing a jacket and tie every day. He wasn't interested in being in school two hours longer than you know, most people were in Chicago. He wasn't interested in being at Urban Prep. And so he did every single thing he could to get put out. He did not want to be there. He wouldn't study, he wouldn't do his homework, he would start fights. Anything he could do to leave, he would do. And eventually, he got his wish. We didn't put him out, but his mother gave up and said, I can't fight this battle anymore, so they transferred him. And he transferred into a traditional neighborhood school. At his new school, people weren't hassling him to hit the books. In fact, they didn't care if he read or not. They weren't telling him to pull up his pants. They didn't care how he looked. They weren't telling him to live honestly and nonviolently and honorably as the urban, cre urban prep creed dictates because they didn't seem to care how he lived or whether he lived at all. A few months after Mr. Branch left urban prep, I noticed something very strange I, I would be at a you know, basketball game or something, and Branch would be there. I would walk you know, into the little area outside the school at dismissal, and Branch would be there. Once I walked into a classroom, one of our late afternoon classes, <laughs> and Branch was there. He wasn't one of our students anymore, though. He had gotten his wish. He wanted to be rid of urban prep, and he got out. He had escaped. It was very clear to us that he wanted to be back in. Finally, he got up the courage to ask if he could transfer back into urban prep, and we said yes. Because at urban prep, we don't believe in throwing kids away even those who think they might want to be discarded. Less than a year later, when Mr. Branch was asked by a group of visiting educators about his most significant experience at Urban Prep, he said that if, he hadn't, if we hadn't taken him back, he would have been dead by the time he was 18. With tears streaming down his face in front of an audience of complete strangers, he said, in fact, at that other school, I was dying a little bit each and every day. His words, not mine. I was dying a little bit each and every day. Mr. Branch went on to win the Urban Prep Medal for Most Improved Student. He became the student government president. And recently, he stopped in my office to say hello while he was home for summer vacation from Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee.